In ancient Greece, Diogenes the Cynic arose daily from the barrel in which he lived, greeted only by his canine companions, and he went out amongst the citizens of Athens. His message, to laugh at their conventions, their slave state and its ideology. He threw a plucked chicken into Plato's academy in order to mock the philosopher's attempts to define the essence of man. He made demands of emperors that they got out the fuck of his sunlight, and all because he defied their parochial view of life on this earth. Whilst they were sovereigns of empires or citizens of nations, Diogenes proclaimed himself the first citizen of the world, the first cosmopolitan. Welcome back to Zero Books. This is Adam from Acid Horizon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Matt McManus to talk about his new book, A How-To Guide to Cosmopolitan Socialism, which also attributes the work of the late, great Michael Brooks. Matt is also the author of The Political Right and Equality, out on Rootledge, and of course, What is Postmodern Conservatism, out on Zero Books too. Matt, a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, man, it's great to be back. Uh, and yeah, you're absolutely fucking right. I mean, if there was a boss, a philosopher in the ancient Greek world, then Socrates or Diogenes you know, would have to be right up there, right? Uh, you know, that whole moment where like Alexander's like, what do you want? I'll give you anything. You know, I'm basically like God emperor of the world. So just tell it. He's like, just get out of my sunlight. Right. You're really bothering me. What a move. Right. <laughs> oh, well, let's get things off. Let's just talk about who this is a tribute to. Cause I mean, it's been about three years since we, since we lost Michael Brooks. It may even seem heretical to even say it, but people might not necessarily be a, uh, familiar. Although the, the shows are being rerun to this day. I mean, it's a, we can still go back at that cat. It's even more relevant than it was then. Very similar as these and Fisher's work. So can we just start with sort of who Michael Brooks was and how his book Against the Web and, of course, his general approach to these issues really inspired the work you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael was a left intellectual activist, uh, YouTuber, podcast, kind of did a little bit of everything, right, and mm -hmm. did it all really well, which is one of the reasons people loved him, right? Uh, I could just say, you know, by way of biography, uh, I kind of came across Michael's work, must have been around 2018, uh, through our mutual mm -hmm. friend, Ben Burgess, uh, who is also a zero book author, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I really enjoyed their dialogues back and forth, uh, particularly on issues of things like cosmopolitanism, Trump administration, you name it. Uh, and I was super lucky uh, that I was able to interview uh, Michael for zero books mm -hmm. in 2020, shortly before he died. Uh, I mean, none of us knew that was going to happen. It was a freak accident. Mm -hmm. uh, but boy, was he a great guy, right? Just really put you at ease whenever he was talking to you. If you asked him a question about his work, he was empathetic and warm. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost even a bit embarrassed that you would talk to him about his work. He was always mm -hmm. like, you know, how are you? You know, what do you think about this? Or what are your thoughts, right? Just very other oriented. Uh, and then of course, his great book, uh, really his only book, unfortunately, Against the Web, uh, laid out a fantastic criticism uh, of the intellectual dark web and ended uh, with this mm -hmm. little section uh, on cosmopolitan socialism, talking about people like Cornel West, Amartya Sen, uh, a lot of his different heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of us were really interested to see where he was going to go with that because like I said, it's just a couple of little paragraphs here at the end. Uh, and then, you know, sadly, we all know what happened, right? Uh, he passed away way too young at 36. Uh, and so the project was left incomplete. Uh, and I got to tell you, when I was asked, do you want to write a book on cosmopolitan socialism because you have a background in international law and, you know, you mm -hmm. viewed Michael's book, I was scared shitless, right? Uh, like, how could I possibly do tribute uh, to mm -hmm. somebody who did so much in such a short period of time uh, and was so beloved, rightly, by countless people. Um, I don't know if the book succeeds at that. That's really for everyone else to decide. Uh, but I certainly did my best uh, to pay tribute to Michael uh, and his heroes, people like San and Cornell West, wherever it is that I could. Uh, and I hope that this puts a little bit of flesh on, on the bones of his idea in a way that, you know, if he's looking down, uh, he would think was appropriate uh, or at least kind of cool. Mm -hmm. No, and absolutely, as we go through the book, we will try to make as many references to some of uh, Michael's work as possible. I mean, just to start off, one of the things I think the book does so successfully is the incredible rigor of the history of the idea of cosmopolitanism, the idea of the global city, of being a citizen of the world. I mean, you cover everything from a shocker to Augustine. And then, of course, the, it seems like the main interlocutor here, at least the sort of tradition out of which socialism as an intellectual movement grew out of, really does stem from this 
liberal, uh, not well, say that Kant's a liberal, Kant is a liberal in many senses, but basically from Kant. Kant's idea of, you know, he wrote these two amazing pieces, the universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view, and mostly the idea of perpetual peace. What is it that could end war on earth? And this is, you know, as you, as you mentioned, it's the, influence, it's, it's the influence for so many ideas about supranational or international institutions, particularly in the, you know, the United Nations, and as well as the International Criminal Court. So could we just start by unpacking this, this Kantian element of cosmopolitanism and how it comes into the development of the idea as we arrive at it from like a socialist standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, first off, it's important to say that there's a clear genealogy between Kant uh, mm. and Marx and Engels, right? Uh, in the mm. sense that uh, Marx and Engels are really the third figures, uh, the third figures in a trio uh, of German uh, theorists and philosophers that move from Kant through Hegel, Schelling, uh, and Kalmany uh, in their own work. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting work that's done tracing the evolution of Kantian ideas into various kinds of Marxist idioms. Uh, yeah, for instance, Alan Wood has really done fantastic stuff on this. Uh, but at the core uh, of Kant's ethics and what he shares with socialism are, are two principles, really. Uh, one is this commitment that all people are entitled uh, to a certain degree of freedom, uh, purely by virtue of being human. Uh, and secondly, this idea that human institutions as they exist right now and human ideologies, he doesn't use that term, but I think it's accurate, uh, are very much the products of reason. Uh, there's nothing natural or divinely ordained about them. Uh, and much as they've been constructed by reason, they can be deconstructed by reason and criticized. Uh, and Kant, for instance, is very critical uh, of various forms of what he calls heteronomy, right? Uh, which is this kind of faultless default to the prevailing ways of thinking about things. Uh, and even sounds a little bit Marxist, where he points out that the prevailing ways of thinking about things, the forms of heteronomy that your society takes, obviously work to the benefit of authoritarians, since they want a mostly uncritical, thoughtless population. Uh, and this has a direct link, of course, to his arguments for cosmopolitanism, because even though the idea is pretty primitive uh, in Kant, uh, and I also want to add, not nearly uh, uh, socialist enough for my take, uh, you know, Kant was a horrible racist in a lot of ways and misogynist, and there's a lot of qualifications we have to add when praising his work. Uh, but this idea he puts forward that there's something extremely arbitrary uh, about privileging the moral good of members of your community over the moral good of people outside of your community when both are equally human and equally entitled to freedom and dignity, right? Uh, and he puts forward this really pioneering argument uh, in perpetual peace that we should progress towards a community of republics that will respect the rights of others regardless uh, of where they come from. Uh, now, some of this is a little clunky by 20th century or 21st century standards, but some of it, I mean, fucking, we still haven't. Uh, fully done credit to today. If you think about his arguments for things like universal hospitality uh, or this idea that we should just do away with war and establish perpetual peace, right? Think about what's going on right now mm. uh, in Ukraine and many parts of the world, right? Uh, so I'll leave it there, but there's just a lot of richness to Kant's work that is a testament both to his genius uh, and to the extent that socialists and you know liberal egalitarians need to be critical mm. of elements of it. Uh, I think we should keep a sharp eye on what can be retrieved from the project. Now, to particularly picking up on what you said about hospitality, though, I think the idea of hospitality in Canada is probably one of the most productive contradictions mm -hmm. the people on the left can grasp. Because, I mean, even Derrida develops this in his work, your know, hospitality, the idea that hospitality, hospitality comes from the root hostis, which also means hostility. Mm -hmm. The idea that one has the right to visit as a guest or to be treated as a guest also comes with the conditions, the, the internal paradoxes of being allowed in only as a guest. So when we talk about um, issues around open, you know, opening up the border, but the, you can go to the abolition of the border. The question of hospitality is one we really need to struggle with, especially given the idea of, we're, we're even at a liberal standpoint, the capitalist system is failing at its own ideal, its ideological roots when it comes to the question of hospitality. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and one of the interesting things about perpetual mm. peace uh, is that is very different than what you find neoliberal states articulating right now mm. uh, is the typical rhetoric around things like refugees uh, is that mm. we'll take in as many uh, as we can possibly afford uh, and that's mm. it. Uh, or if you're a kind of neoliberal reactionary like Donald Trump, uh, you'll say, you know, we'll take in no one uh, and they'll just have to learn to deal. Uh, Kant's mm. argument, if you take it seriously, is actually very radical, which is that you aren't, a, it's not a matter of generosity uh, to offer people hospitality. 
if they're fleeing from certain circumstances. It's a right that they have against the state. Uh, and if you think mm-hmm. about that, that what that really means is it's not really up to you to decide whether or not these people can come in. They are entitled to do so uh, unless they pose a danger to your community. Uh, and he doesn't put any kind of restrictions or constraints on that right. Uh, now, think about mm-hmm. what would be entailed by taking that principle seriously in a way that it never has been, right? Uh, it would completely upend uh, our understanding of the international refugee system, for example. Mm. Uh, and it would really deflate the ambitions of right-wing populists like Donald Trump or Viktor Orban, uh, who are very prone to wanting mm. to say, you know, either don't come here or if you do come here, uh, make sure you have the right skin color, make sure you belong to the right religion, and make sure that you have a lot of money and a lot of prof- uh, like professional training, right? Uh, so again, mm. definitely big problems with Kant's view. I think um, radical black liberals like Charles Mill uh, drawing from the Marxist tradition have been scathingly critical of a lot of the limitations to his viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, but recovering this idea of cosmopolitanism and universal hospitality is something that I think the left should be proud to do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, when it comes to Kant, I think the real issue is, and of course people at Mills and uh, have pointed this out, is that it's not so much the cosmopolitan aspect of you know the uni- ideas of universal human rights and human rights hospitality. It's Kant's idea of the human. It's the anthropological <laughs> basis. It's like okay, if we if we if we see if we can somehow unplug that, and simply replace it, replace an account of man with an account of I mean, something that doesn't necessarily require us to stratify it that way, then essentially we can get to. It. I mean, this also applies to one of the main critics of Kant, who is also, in you know, uh, very much uh, grounded in a lot of racial anthropology, particularly when it comes to their later work, which is Hegel. You know, contrary to this, this Kantian theory of international relations, which posits the possibility of a perpetual peace, we have the Hegelian tradition, and the, the two enter into a very productive dynamic. I think you know the global versus the local. Even though, even though you know, Kant is very much the global descending down to the local, you know, sort of to declaring itself from a principal reason, whereas for Hegel, the local is organically developing its own universality across different localities or even just going into a general dialectic of universal versus particular. And this is the question I think Hegel puts to Kant, which is, you know, these systems ultimately have to work locally. Uh, it's very hard to just apply these things abstractly top down. This is what he thinks happens in the French Revolution that goes you know, completely wrong. And I wonder how much this, this sometimes m- maps onto you know, one of Michael Brooks's most sort of memorable maxims, which was be ruthless with systems, be kind with people, which I think summarizes mm-hmm. a lot of the moral impulse behind how we navigate these dialectics of the universal and particular, local and global. And so my question here is really, to, you know, to what extent you know, are cosmopolitanism and universalism simply synonymous to how you think about it? And what work do you think needs to be done in order to you know, make such universalism viable? In the face of the the critiques that you know, end up going, so universalism cannot escape the conditions of its own production. Every universal is kind of ex- abstracted from a certain context, and then therefore extracts something of that context. Be that the universalization of uh, white man as a template, uh, the universalization of the European standpoint, as what Hegel does. Or so, so how the universal escape their particular universality? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and I have to say, props for bringing in uh, Michael's most memorable uh, maxim, right? Uh, hard on systems, kind to people. Something that we should all try to live by, uh, something that maybe even I could do a better job living by sometimes uh, when I'm dealing with the, uh, some of the people who are rude to me, let's just put it that way, uh, on Twitter, on social media. But all that aside, right? Uh, I think that there are points where the Hegelian critique of Kant is correct uh, and points where it needs to be refined, particularly through strong injections uh, of Marxism, right? Uh, So I think that the first thing that we need to say is that both Kant and Hegel weren't necessarily just prejudiced, although they were that, right? Uh, Any good Marxist would also point out that they were defined by the contradictions latent within bourgeois society and reflected those contradictions in their thought. And to the extent that they were unable to overcome them or they affirmed them, uh, that's just because they hadn't been sufficiently materialist uh, and recognized that there was a higher kind of society on the horizon than bourgeois society, which I would postulate would be democratic or liberal socialism, but we don't need to get into that, right? So in terms of the Hegelian critique of Kant's cosmopolitanism, I think that Hegel does have very one good, one very good critique, uh, which is that the kind of atomistic individualism that one sometimes finds articulated in Kant, uh, not in his best work, but you do sometimes find it articulated there, 
is inherently problematic, right? This idea that individual self-legislators reasoning independently uh, will coincide in their conclusions upon what kind of Republican institutions they should produce uh, and coincide in what kind of laws those Republican institutions will produce, uh, and then in turn uh, develop a kind of cosmopolitan installation. Uh, that's highly idealist uh, in the worst sense of the world, right? Uh, and Hegel stresses the fact that, look, uh, the ethical realm where we come to know one another as individuals uh, and recognize ourselves in our particularity and in our shared particularity uh, is absolutely necessary to engender the feelings of kindness and empathy that you are talking about, right? Uh, and he thinks that this is a point against cosmopolitanism because he says these kinds of ethical ties might very well be possible at the national level, uh, but you're never going to see them engendered internationally uh, or from a, a kind of cosmopolitan standpoint, which precludes the possibility of developing something like the cosmopolitan institutions can't think is extremely important, right? Now, this is a genuine problem, right? It's not a fake problem. Uh, and you know, Hegel is respectful of Kant while also, I think, uh, highlighting that there is definitely, again, this idealism in a bad sense. But I think that we can argue against Hegel and maybe for Kant uh, that Hegel underestimates the importance of negation uh, in his own system of reasoning. Uh, and this is where I, for instance, am very critical of right Hegelianism, because I would postulate that this notion that the nation state level constitutes the apex uh, of our ethical ties, uh, and it will never develop past that, uh, that seems contrary to the imminent and progressive logic baked into the system. And it also seems extremely idealist uh, in the sense that it posits that the only reason why we can form meaningful associations with one another is on the basis of our shared ethnic identity, uh, rather than the kind of Marxist point, which is that we can form ties with one another uh, through all and be engaged in productive and material kinds of work, which is something that is shared commonly across the entire human species, right? Uh, so once we take this idea of negation seriously and add healthy injections of materialism and, and a, a reference to Lager into the Hegelian system, uh, then we can make the argument that, look, uh, maybe a kind of nation-state disposition was appropriate in the 19th century when Hegel was writing. Uh, but we can do a lot better than that uh, by positing, for instance, that workers are being exploited everywhere. They have a lot in common with one another. Uh, and amongst other things, they have nothing to lose but their change. So let's try to create institutions on that ethical basis that will be more conducive to their short flourishing globally, which will include adopting cosmopolitan institutions. I think that critique of Hegel is pretty much, yes, pretty much dead on us. But it's interesting, especially as well, when we think about the moments in Hegel where he knows the system isn't working for any, well, it's not working for a specific group of people. You know, in the philosophy of right, we have the rabble. And the rabble, his solution, this group in society which cannot find their material needs satisfied and therefore their moral needs, according to Hegel, they cannot, they cannot, they don't fit in. But they're nonetheless the product, the irreducible remainder, to take a term from a sacred term from Schelling, um, of the society. And what is his solution? He said, well, they have to go across the sea and go settle somewhere else. They have to go to the yeah. And what's interesting, well, it's not all the most mistakes then. And what's actually, no, it was, scratch that. Now, what's interesting though about this is, the way in which it shapes the ideology of German colonialism going forward. So, so, my, so my research is on the left and right Hegelian divide, particularly left Hegelianism in the 1840s. And <laughs> so I, I was looking at, I was looking at, it's mostly on Stern, and I'm like, I was looking at, okay, so why aren't they talking about something like colonialism this time? Uh, they talk about domination all the time. And I was looking at the ideology of German colonialism, like the, the, because colonialism hadn't kicked off in by like, the German empire wasn't kicking off at that point but the, there were those of colonial societies and rather than having a sort of anglo and french ideology you know like the white man's burden of kipling that they are unified they are bringing people up to universal the ideology of a lot of these german colonial societies was we need to preserve uh, our ethical order you know our sittlichkeit against capitalism and that's why we need to go somewhere <laughs> it's the rabbles will start organizing themselves and it's fascinating to see how particular in a way particularized Hegel's system really can be, especially in relation to the, yeah, he understands, is a core, I'm going to say his materialist core there, because I think ultimately Hegel, whilst given the logic of social relations, can't apply them socially, but there is nonetheless, the, the material concerns haunt him in this debate. And even as we are talking about before the show, you know, the idea of applying Hegel's dialectic of rights to states themselves ends up producing a supranational order. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. So look, in my book, The Political Right and Equality, I have a section on Hegel uh, as a right-wing thinker. Uh, and I've gotten plenty of people who sat there and emailed me being like, how dare you? You know, uh, Hegel is, you know, a predecessor to Marx. Uh, this idea of dialectics is inherently anti-reactionary. And I want to be clear that I agree with all of that. Right? I don't ultimately think that Hegel is a right-wing thinker. I think that read appropriately, uh, he offers some of the most lethal weapons uh, against any kind of reactionary system. Uh, idealist weapons, which are problematic, but weapons nonetheless, right? Uh, and what I think the mo one of the most important to my mind uh, is this idea of self-consciousness in relationship to one's own ethical world, uh, which is also an mm -hmm. idea that one finds in more primitive form in Kant. Uh, but what's important about this idea of being self-conscious in relation to the ethical world is that it allows us to see that it is the product of our will and our imagination and our reason, right? Uh, and in ideal circumstances, it would be a ground for our freedom, right? Uh, but very quickly, of course, we can mm -hmm. become alienated uh, from the ethical world in which we inhabit. Uh, and then it becomes a system mm -hmm. of domination that's reified and hegemonic uh, and consequently maybe needs to be overturned or completely overcome. Uh, where I agree with Marx, mm -hmm. of course, is that Hegel is too idealistic uh, in his approach to this. Uh, we need to recognize that a lot of the forms of reification that emerge within our contemporary society uh, are the consequence of the commodity form uh, that has become mm. prevalent all over the place. Uh, in fact, it's probably never been more prevalent than right now. And I talk a lot about this in my book, uh, What is Postmodern Conservatism for Zero? And mm. you know, its sequel, uh, The Rise of Postmodern mm. Conservatism and a few other things, right? So that's what I like to say uh, about Hegel. Uh, and we should reject the reactionary vision of Hegel, uh, while also appreciating that there are reasons why conservatives think that they can adapt his system uh, to posit mm -hmm. this idea of a kind of ethical order that will be largely unchanging uh, and that is not sufficiently universalistic to aspire to the kind of radical global changes that people like Marx uh, mm -hmm. or even sometimes people like Kant uh, would want to see. What's always fascinated me is the propensity for right to gainism to provide its own negation. I mean, even going back to the formation of the, the, the left Hegelians. So, I don't know if you know this, but Bruno Bauer was the, the rising star of the right Hegelians. Yeah, the idea is just what we have to use Hegel to justify what is. And he was sent in to uh, refute a guy called you know, David Strauss's book on the historicity of Jesus. And uh, he basically said, okay, I've been sent here to write down how the biblical narrative follows from the necessity of dialectical logic. And the problem is that he did do that. And in doing so, you show, you know, it's like the master-servant dialectic. You show that actually the Bible's dependent on the dialectic of self-consciousness, not the other way around. And then he has this Damascene moment when he goes to Berlin, meets Feuerbach, and they start the free ones, you know, the, the, the Berliner young Hegelians. So it's, I mean, I'm surprised. Are there still any right Hegelians about? I mean, I don't know, maybe we could oh, yeah. call this uh, Victor Orban's a right Hegelian. I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, there, there's still plenty of them about, and they're really the subject of a large part of my book, right? So uh, mm. in the United States, you have people like Paul Gottfried, uh, who is actually one of the figures who coined the phrase alt-right, uh, and he was Richard Spencer's uh, PhD supervisor. Uh, not something he's proud about now, and he's tried his best to encourage us to forget that, but it's true. Uh, but he wrote a very important book um, for the American hard right, uh, on Hegel's influence on conservatism generally, uh, arguing that he should enjoy something of a renaissance uh, in American circles, right? Uh, or, you know, if you want, you can talk about the tradition of British idealism that's included people like Bradley or Michael Oakeshott or Roger Scruton, right? Uh, all of whom use Hegel uh, to argue for a kind of traditionalist, not authoritarian, but definitely aristocratic uh, kind of liberalism uh, and you know, justify it by appealing to things like the need for order, uh, this idea of a kind of transcendent national entity uh, that persists over time, all the stuff that you would recognizably associate with right Hegelianism, right? So I think it's alive and well. I think it's fundamentally the wrong way to approach Hegel. Uh, if anything, I'd even go further and say it does a disservice again to the power and centrality of negation uh, that pervades Hegel's thought at its best. Uh, but again, say whatever you will about Hegel. He's an engine for thought. Uh, there was a meme that I posted the other day that got an awful lot of lights, which is like, you know, this guy is like, Hegel is right. And then it goes to Hegel is wrong. And then Hegel is right. And Hegel is wrong. You know, we all go through that process. Uh, and whatever else you might want to say about Hegel, whether he's right or wrong, uh, or left wing or progressive, uh, no one can deny the importance of reflecting uh, on his thinking or producing our own original thoughts uh, and our own kind of intuitions uh, about what needs to take place in the 21st century. 
Yep. Totally agree. I mean, I've recently come off of doing a two hour lecture on Hegel after just sleeves drying myself as a recovering Hegelian. It's like <laughs> learning to get stretchy old Hegel muscles, do a bit of Hegelese. Even today, I recorded something on. Uh, or coming forth, listeners, RuPaul and the Master Servant dialectic, and it, it's it. <laughs> believe me, it can work. But yeah, you know, if you can't recognize it. yourself, how the hell can you recognize someone else? Can I get an <laughs> amen? Uh, but let's okay. let's let's pick up on that thread of actually of Roger Scruton, because if you go to Budapest, you can go into the Roger Scruton Cafe, yeah. and if the question is if if this is possible, then the question is who are the postmodern conservatives? Who because they are that's it, they are the sort of the enemies of this block. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, they are the people who are dialectically opposed, or maybe just straight up opposed. If you want to take it out of a dialectic to the, to the idea of cosmopolitan socialism, they are incredibly, in a way, they're, they're internationally nationalist. I mean, uh, it almost seems to some extent like I mean, Hungary is a very good example. Hungary seems to be kind of a, a test bed for conservative policy ideas, similar to the way that certain surveillance technologies can be tested in other in authoritarian states. Um, quite as nominally democratic. I mean, they closed the Lukács archive years ago. I don't think they still haven't opened it back up. Orban's, you know, funding stuff like the, the MCC from Brussels. There might be one in the UK. There's a political report on the huge amounts of money going into Hungary, you know. And, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, hell, we had a CPAC in Hungary. You know, there's not many other places that have a CPAC. So, yeah, I think maybe just take an example. I know you'll give the examples of uh, India under Modi, uh, Poland, of course, the United States. Maybe to some extent, yeah. Well, I don't know. UK under Johnson, probably still the UK. Let's be honest. So, who, who are the postmodern conservatives, and what makes them so postmodern? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would absolutely say that the UK, unfortunately, is still in the midst of its own postmodern conservative surge. Uh, I mean, who would have thought that people would be sitting there asking whether or not Liz Truss uh, would outlast a lettuce uh, two or three years ago, and yet here we are, right? Uh, and I must say, as a progressive, I quite enjoyed seeing her premiership uh, quite dramatically short. Uh, not because, you know, she didn't do horrible things, uh, which is awful, but just because she was such a bad, bad leader that, you know, seeing the lettuce out last year was really personally endearing. Uh, so, again, postmodern conservatism, very briefly, uh, is the form of reactionary politics that emerges in a postmodern culture. Uh, that's it very simply, right? But obviously the devil is in the details. So... To make as long story as short as I can, uh, I agree with people like Mark Fisher, Frederick Jameson, uh, Dave Harvey, right, that at a certain point in the mid-century, we entered a postmodern moment, uh, which was largely catalyzed by the emergence of neoliberal capitalism, and that led to the erosion of a historical concept of time uh, that was important to certain forms of liberal progressivism and, of course, to socialism. Uh, and what I mean by this idea of historical consciousness of time uh, was exactly what you know you find in Marx and Hegel, this notion that the social form that we live within right now isn't necessarily the last word on the ideal human enterprise or the ideal human association. Uh, given you know historical dialectics, especially materialist dialectics, we can anticipate that a new social form will emerge in the future after a long period of struggle, and it'll be more conducive to human flourishing uh, than the current one that we reside within now. Uh, now, I would deny that there was any kind of teleological necessity to this, uh, and I resist orthodox Marxist and Hegelian insistences that you know we can defend something like a teleological vision of history. But the idea of historical freedom and historical time, I think, was deeply inspiring, right? Uh, and leading people to hope uh, that the future could be better for them uh, and that to invoke Thomas Paine, we had it in our power to make the world anew and make it better, right? Uh, of course, what you see with the advent of neoliberalism uh, is a very different kind of attitude that's emerged, that emerges. Uh, there's this insistence, qua Margaret Thatcher, and this is Mark Fisher's main point and Jameson's, uh, that there's no alternative uh, but to reconcile ourselves to neoliberal spaces and neoliberal forms of economic organization. And the form of time consciousness that emerges uh, in that context is a phenomenological time consciousness, right? Uh, it's ones that sees things maybe in terms of the local community and its traditions and expectations, uh, but it's highly individuated, very much centered upon what's going to happen to me in the future. Uh, and there's all kinds of anxious pathologies uh, that emerge as a result of this, because what happens, of course, is that we can no longer project hopes and expectations for our communal future. So the best that we can really do is hope that we ourselves individuals will be better off, but this will probably come at the cost 
uh, of other people being better off because we live within a highly competitive, very stratified society that will be divided into winners and losers. And you better make sure that you belong to the winners. Otherwise, you'll wind up with the losers. Uh, and I argue that in this kind of environment, uh, it was an ideal setting for various kinds of hyper-reactionary kind of dispositions to flourish. Now, there's a complicated relationship between neoliberalism and other forms of conservative reaction that I talk a lot about in my new book, um, The Political Right and Inequality, right? But to put it mildly, right, uh, I think that Trump simultaneously reflected a kind of response to this neoliberal ethos uh, that drew very heavily on a reactionary tradition uh, while at the same time embodying its worst impulses. Uh, because to a certain extent, he did challenge uh, the faux universalistic aspirations uh, of neoliberalism by saying that we can return to a kind of ethnostate disposition. Uh, he also did challenge it by saying that we are no longer going to even pretend that neoliberal capitalism works to the benefit of those, for instance, in the global south uh, or, you know, for American workers in, you know, Appalachian communities. Uh, we're going to insist that we're going to take the gloves off and we're going to use American state power to continue to have neoliberal institutions, but we're actively going to make sure that they work to the benefit of Americans first and foremost and the wealthiest Americans uh, above all, right? Uh, and at the same time as he issued these kinds of faux challenges, uh, he again really relished in the attitude of neoliberalism, uh, especially this kind of competitive ethos, because it's very telling that the fundamental epistemic and normative categories in Trumpism, uh, to put it in proper Trumpese, was precisely that the world divides into winners and losers. Uh, and Trump was a winner. Everyone else was a loser. If you sided with Trump, then you'd be, you would also belong to the winners. Uh, but the biggest danger, of course, to this uh, was precisely that all those nasty leftists, progressives and liberals and globalist elites, uh, who are losers, whether they acknowledge it or not, uh, they would try to expropriate the status, position, and wealth of the winners using various forms of political activism. Uh, and to prevent that uh, or to return things to the way they should be, you need to put your faith in somebody like Trump uh, and he'll restore the natural order of things. Uh, and while doing so, he really relished uh, in a lot of these kinds of postmodern characteristics. Uh, again, this epistemic skepticism that was employed strategically in order to justify uh, you know, a wide variety of extraordinarily toxic policies. Uh, you also saw people like Johnson really embody a postmodern ethic in transforming himself essentially into a kind of celebrity entertainment figure uh, and assuming that the British public would be, uh, sorry, the British public would be nihilistic enough uh, to almost enjoy that uh, with the supposition that really nothing matters, so you might as well enjoy the ride downhill, right? And there are innumerable other examples of this, uh, but I think that the kind of nihilism embodied by postmodern conservatism is a real threat. Uh, to human civilization, quite frankly. Uh, and we need very pronounced progressive policies to try to roll it back wherever it happens to emerge. Good. It's the point of John, yeah, the idea of the media spectacle. Well, is it even a spectacle at this point? Because it's, it's, spectacle is something you look at, whereas this one invites you to partake in it. You know, the idea oh, of sure, yeah. Trump being something of a civic religion, uh, sort of <laughs> in the form of QAnon, or even... Britain having kind of weird civic religiosity about itself. I mean, there's actually something that really came up, which I think is a really good resource talking about the idea of a postmodern conservatism, or even actually, I think you even describe it as something like some kind of reactionary media based Maoism, because Rupert Murdoch's um, like resignation statement ends with something which was probably, you could probably see on fucking Compact magazine, to be honest, which is, um, it says basically that. He's, he, he's, this is like the fourth paragraph of his retirement statement. This is the man who has more or less, not single-handedly, but had one of the most interesting or most fucking demonic effects on public discourse, the very ways our brains are structured, the way we take in information in any way where this man owns a newspaper, you know, the, the political kingmaker in Britain and to, to fucking love to extent America as well, and even Australia, he, he writes this. Elites have an open contempt, kind of self-serving bureaucracies are seeking to silence those who would question their provenance and purpose. Elites have open contempt for those who are not members of their rarefied class. Most of the media is in cahoots with those elites, peddling political narratives rather than pursuing the truth. 
<laughs> Rupert Murdoch is not the media elite, apparently. He, they, they, people, they have to say that they're always on the fucking yeah. back foot. They're like Maoists. It's like, it's like some sort of Maoist like, media um, monopoly. Oh, yeah, no, that, that was just extraordinarily funny, right? Uh, I mean, it's the same kind of thing uh, when you hear Donald Trump uh, talk about how nobody has ever been as persecuted in the history of the United States as him. And you're like, really? You know, you're a billionaire and you're a fucking president, right? I mean, how much more privileged do you possibly want to be? Uh, how much more liberated uh, from any kind of responsibilities could you possibly be, right? Uh, but I think that this is part of the appeal uh, of these forms of postmodern conservatism, right? Uh, they simultaneously embody a sense of elitism and victimization that, from a leftist standpoint, uh, can look very contradictory, but it really works in practice for them, especially mm. within a postmodern moment. Uh, because conservatives, to a certain extent, do have a good reason to see themselves as victims in a way that leftists need to appreciate, right? Uh, because conservatives typically regard themselves as entitled to various kinds of power, status, affluence, whatever you want to call it, uh, that aren't available to ordinary people, right? Uh, and they often mm -hmm. think that were society to be functioning the way that it should or were the natural order to be functioning the way that it should, uh, they would have, you know, the status, affluence, and power because that's the ordained mm -hmm. natural or transcendent order. Um, but the reason that they don't enjoy these things to the extent that they should uh, is because of mm -hmm. artificial uh, movements that want to change things particularly driven by leftists and progressives. Uh, so there is this kind of sense in which conservatives perceive themselves as victims because they think that leftists want to take their privileges away from them. And I have to say bluntly that they might be right about that, right? If you're the kind of person that attaches a great deal of weight to not be uh, an equal to your fellow citizens, then you probably wouldn't like living within a leftist society because mm -hmm. the sense of elevation uh, isn't something that would be available to you to the same extent in a democratic socialist society, right? So that's where the element of victimization comes in. Uh, but there's also, again, this element of elitism that's aligned with this because, of course, like I said, uh, this isn't a leftist argument for victimization or domination, where we say this is a subordinate group that has never been granted agency uh, or any kind of meaningful political rights or entitlement, uh, and they should get them now precisely because they've been denied them for far too long. Uh, this is a group that thinks that were the world going its way, uh, they would have everything, uh, and they've only been denied uh, recognition of their intrinsic superiority because of these artificial mechanisms that have been put in place by the left. Uh, and that allows many of these people to feel like they are elites, right? Uh, they might very well be elites that have been denied recognition of their elite status, but they still are elites deep down. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, of course, is a very appealing message to tell to a lot of people. And it explains why it is that figures like Trump can be very, very intoxicating. Uh, because mm -hmm. for many people who are told, you belong to a great American nation, uh, that most other people aren't entitled to because they're not part of the club. Uh, that's a very powerful message for that reactionaries can advance. And uh, the left needs to be as effective as it can in offering a more sustainable uh, and more inspiring message that will attract a lot of public attention and mm. rile popular support for our own causes. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely also this, this ideology, not necessarily from Rupert Murdoch, his, his resources aren't going, but for people generally, I think it definitely is an effect of you know, essentially neoliberalism has pillaged the entire state apparatus, it, where there even was one, and the pool of resources people have access to, this, this futurity is completely lost to them. It, and you can, you, know, you can even see this in some parts of, of the left in like, you know, basically any, any sort of dowardly mobile sort of middle strata is going to like defend Defend, defend sort of their, their gains as, as privileges. And if you, if you see it as a privilege based on you due to an ethnic or particular membership of a community, yeah, you're going to go react. You're going to go react. Even if it is, even if it's a community like consumption, I mean, I don't quite. Occasionally I'll see, I'll see a happy occasion moment. So I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, it, and actually Liz trusted this as well in the UK parliament once, yeah. which is the decline of everything is, is this one man to blame for this. Michelle Foucault. If it wasn't for Michelle Foucault, God damn it. Yeah, you know, Marxism be taught in every school, we'd have total hegemony. You know, it's uh, Liz Truss says uh, the reason why white kids aren't doing very well in school is that one bald motherfucker. You know, he, he destroyed the Soviet Union. It's like, guys, guys, this fight, we're, we're, we're losing poor resources. That means we need to band together a bit more and start arguing about the body books. But 
it's it's this aspect of decline i think is absolutely part of the material conditions that, that, that transform this and so i guess that's the that's the option of, of any left to offer an alternative or at least highlight where the mechanisms of the everyday simply aren't going to be there to provide it yeah absolutely and i mean this is a constant feature of conservatism uh, and the political right from the very beginning right uh, which is mm-hmm. one to suppose that its vision of a hierarchically ordained society uh, is either completely natural mm. or transcendently ordained. Uh, and there is no meaningful reason to suppose that it would ever be challenged if it weren't for artificial uh, or unnatural features within uh, the social order that want to disrupt uh, this kind of internally enduring mm. hierarchy, right? Uh, at the same time, the paradox is that there seems to be a kind of latent awareness of the fact that these things aren't naturally or transcendently ordained, that human will uh, and often a tremendous amount of coercion is actually what keeps society running in the hierarchy of form that many on the political right uh, want to see it running. Uh, and this is why power continuously requires various forms of reification uh, in order to be function, mm-hmm. uh, functional and the continuous subordination of those groups that challenge the status quo. Uh, and you'll constantly see conservatives go back and forth uh, between positing, again, the naturalness or sublimity of their viewpoint that will never change uh, and regarding it as so threatened Mm. um, by the groups that emerge to challenge it that these various forms of reification and coercion are absolutely necessary in order to get us back on track. Now, this position Mm. is, of course, inherently contradictory, uh, but it's a productive Mm. contradiction for many on the right that animates Mm. a lot of their energies rather than one that leads to various moments of self-doubt. Uh, and you see this also mm. reflected again in the attitudes they take towards the left, which is always simultaneously very weak, uh, you know, striving against the natural order, uh, trying to challenge God's ordained plan, mm. uh, and too strong, right? Uh, constantly threatening to overwhelm fragile institutions, replace, you know, rule by the natural elite with rule by the mass or the demos and the mm. vulgar swinish multitude, right? Uh, again, very much productive kind of contradiction uh, on the right. Uh, and one that continues to have effective appeal for a long time. Mm. And of course, this always leads to a very Hitlerite tendency of victimization where any sort of deviation from normality as such is therefore, I mean, you see this with DeSantis, the entire transphobic crusade, and of course, the one the media proliferates in the UK. And of course, the, the, the incredible amounts of Hungarian and American dark money that funds it in the UK. It's, it's truly a spectacle to see. I mean, it, I guess let's, let's move on from talking about uh, the postmodern conservatives as much to really get to the positive case here for cosmopolitan socialism. But one of the things I think that's interesting philosophically that informs your formulation is this idea you you, you coin as, as militant particularism. Mm-hmm. As such, so it is a sentence I've, I've, I just want to read it out. So we we need a left which is able to retain militant particularism's paradoxically universalistic demand for inclusion while balancing that against a cosmopolitan effort to reform the global power dynamics of 20th or 21st sorry, century capital. What do you mean by this? What is militant particularism here? How do you think this critique from mili- uh, what you call militant particularism can help revise elements of certain leftist orthodoxy, particularly Marxist ones in the vein of democratic socialism? And I guess there's a further question we'll get into later, but it's yeah, mostly about this, this return of moral argumentation. But I think let's bracket out for now and focus on this, this theoretical groundwork. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a deeper story than my book entirely gets into because, uh, you know, I want to be kind of short and quippy. Uh, so a lot of this is just sketched out uh, rather than fully argued for. But the short story is that from about the 19th century to about the mid 20th century, the predominant left-wing movement in the world uh, was, of course, advocacy for socialism, right? Uh, now, this took a huge number of different forms, whether you're thinking about, you know, socialism that advocated for a command economy of the sort that you saw in um, the USSR or in communist China, which is not to my taste, uh, but also socialism of the sort that you'd see in, say, the Nordic countries, um, and to a certain extent within con- uh, countries of Western Europe, which is more to my taste, uh, albeit with a million qualifications, right? Uh, now, these movements had achieved an awful lot, right? Uh, Particularly in the context that I discussed. Uh, But there was always a systemic failure uh, to incorporate the concerns of rising feminist movements, rising anti-colonial movements, uh, rising uh, critical race movements and civil rights movements into this socialist narrative. 
Uh, and what you really start to see theoretically in the 1970s with the advent of the postmodern movement uh, is an argument against the kind of universalistic subject that many postmodern critics saw as latent within various kinds of socialist theory and within socialist movements, particularly this idea that the proletariat, uh, you know, the working industrial man, and I stress man, particularly white man, uh, will be the avatar of our salvation. Okay? Now, there was always something of a caricature uh, when it came to these postmodern critiques uh, of socialist authors uh, and their emphasis on this particular subject. But there's also a kind of liberatory quality to it as well, because what you saw many of these authors do uh, was create spaces on the theoretical left for voices that had long been denied uh, and also given theoretical sophistication uh, in a way that could challenge the various forms of patriarchy and white supremacy uh, and neoliberal or capitalist imperialism, uh, all of which are important challenges that the left needs to overcome. But I think there was a price to be paid for this, which is that taken too far, uh, what you start to see, particularly in the writings of people like, say, Chantal Muff or Ernesto Leclau, is this idea that we should do away with any commitment to universalism whatsoever, uh, that all struggles are irredeemably particularist, and they need to be understood only in terms of their very local context, and that they only really matter uh, to the specific individuals or specific communities that are engaged uh, in any kind of conflict at any given time, right? That's not exactly Mufin the Cloud's position, right? But it was often taken up this way. Uh, and I think that this is a problematic position, right? Uh, it's problematic because it divides the left. Uh, and it's problematic also precisely for the reasons I articulated uh, earlier when I was discussing this postmodern moment, because it denies this idea that there is such a thing as a kind of universal history, uh, that we can move as a species uh, towards a higher mode of production that will be more conducive to human flourishing generally. Uh, and I also think that taken too far, militant particularism can also lead to the sense of anomie uh, or individualism that's or kind of crude individualism that's very compatible with something like, say, woke capitalism. Right. Uh, this idea that, you know, I'm just going to look after me and my group uh, and that'll be enough. So the real theoretical challenge for the left right now is to do something parallel to what I think Nancy Frazier is trying to do in her book, Cannibal Capitalism, uh, which is to find a way to integrate the various struggles against domination together into a systematic narrative and into a theoretical whole that will allow us to posit a new mode of production, a new form of political organization that will be generally conducive to human flourishing without losing sight of the particularity of various kinds of social struggles uh, and their centrality to the groups that are most affected by them. Uh, this is a vast task, right? Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, my little book uh, accomplishes this immense uh, task at all, right? Uh, but it's just a kind of plea for... Um, moving in that direction. Uh, and I also think that that's something that Michael was very good at, right? Uh, one of the things that, one of the shared figures that we both really admired was somebody like Cornell West, for example, right? Uh, I think Cornell West, uh, like Nancy Frazier, does a great job of advocating for things like racial equality, uh, drawing attention to the various ways that women in LGBTQ communities have been discriminated against in the United States, while also recognizing uh, that overcoming these forms of domination is going to require more than just particular struggles uh, against homophobia or against patriarchy. It's going to need uh, a more radical transformation of society. Well, I, think, I think that actually accords actually with, with some of my favorite postmodernists to some extent. I mean, uh, particularly some of the work of, uh, I mean, I'm saying Deleuze and Guattari, I think Deleuze and Guattari's sort of later work yeah. on minoritarianism. The proletariat is a coalition of minorities, and, and I think that's one of the most interesting things, especially when someone like Guattari goes to Brazil and meets Lula and studies sort of oh, yeah. the workers' party there. And I, th you know, I think there's very much a sort of a resonance there with even some of the, you know, the, 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 the people we can loosely bunch together. I know you don't. You say post-structuralist. What people might typically think of as post-modernists themselves. I was, I was actually surprised to say that, here that uh, it was Chantel Mouffe and Ernesto Leclerc. I think, I think, yeah, I think they're kind of one of the most problematic Oh, not, not problematic, not in that sense when you say problematic. I think they're problematic is sort of, in the sense, I, I remember talking to someone on the show once before, and I was like, you know, under sort of Corbynism, we was all reading Chantal and Mouffe, we should have been reading bloody Baudrillard, because the enemy was producing reality faster than we could counter it, ultimately. And this, I mean, is that That's a good line. Like, is that, that yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, Chantal and Mouffe's whole thing is populism, you know, creating a chain of equivalences which may unite disparate particulars, 
but nonetheless enunciates them in quite a universalist way. I mean, is it, so I just want to sit with that critique of populism. I mean, is, is, is populism still a useful category, actually, for one, for understanding the post-Balkan conservatives, or is it something, and is it something that the left is hold on to? Because left populism was, in one point, seen as the ascendance at least in terms of you know, electoral politics, form of leftism. We were calling, you know, left populism was the name of the uh, Sanders movement. It was the name of the Corbyn movement. It was the name of some extent, a bit earlier than that's to something like Syriza. And, you know, we know how that turned out. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think this is a very problematic strategic question for the left, uh, but one that we need to think through, right? Uh, so populism doesn't necessarily have need to have any kind of specific uh, content in an overdetermined sense, um, because it just refers more or less to a style uh, of politics and political agitation, right? Uh, usually pitting a people uh, en masse against the elites, right? Uh, and it can have both left-wing connotations and right-wing connotations, right? Uh, the right-wing connotations, again, uh, usually take the form of the victim elite structure that I was talking about before, right? Where you have a virtualist exemplary people uh, who are special in some kind of way, who are under attack by progressive elites, who through various kinds of universalism are trying to deny the status and the privileges uh, of the popular group. Uh, and the right-wing populist leader promises to restore that status, right? Uh, and re-ascribe them into their proper place uh, in the political hierarchy, which is of course at the very top with everyone else at the bottom, right? Uh, Left-wing populism tends to be far more inclusive, right? Uh, first off, it usually draws a lot of its energies from people who have never felt like they were elites, uh, who always feel like they have been subordinated in some kind of important way. Uh, and also it invariably postulates this idea that with the elevation of the left populist leader, what we're gonna do is get rid uh, of various kinds of hierarchical organization, uh, and this, again, has a bit more of a cosmopolitan flavor to it as well, right? Uh, this is, of course, the distinction between us, them, uh, that usually takes on an anti-egalitarian form, uh, is never uh, anywhere more transparent than in suggesting, you know, our national community is more deserving than your national community, right? Or whatever it happens to be, right? So I don't necessarily have a problem with left populism. I think it's absolutely necessary, right? Uh, and I think that we're seeing an extraordinary resurgence uh, of popular left energies in the United States right now over things like uh, the writer's strike or the UAW strike. Uh, and that's something I'm very happy to see. Uh, and I'd hope that we can mobilize a lot of energies on the back of that. I think that the one thing that the left needs to be careful of when it mobilizes uh, popular energy or advances a kind of left populism is there's always the risk that it could become corrupted uh, into a form of right populism. So Alexander Reed Ross has a fantastic book on this called Against Fascist Creep, uh, where he points out how there are many on the political right, uh, including many fascists, who are especially adept uh, when there are left populist movements on the rise at turning uh, the rhetoric and the goals in right-wing directions. Uh, and I think that, you know, many Trumpists have shown themselves to be particularly adept at doing this by kind of assimilating elements of the Sanders program into their own proposals, uh, gutting the, of a lot of substance and saying, we'll also channel in certain kinds of economic elites, uh, but it's primarily going to be in order to get rid of the elements of them that are woke uh, rather than the elements of them that are capitalistic and exploitative, right? Uh, we need to be very resistant to those kinds of things uh, and on guard against corruption um, by these kinds of right-wing ideas when we put forward a left populism. Oh, God, yes. So the W, uh, they, they, they grasped onto that and re-engineered it like a virus and threw it over everything. It's a perfect, abs it's a perfect abstraction. Of, oh, no. Yeah, everything but, I don't uh, like is fucking woke, it's right? Yeah, if we if we if we can't return that word back to its original meaning about social consciousness, oh, good, no, this no, I'm not even going to stay focus on that word. But um, I mean, this this is relevant actually with, with again the positive case here because I know that you you have four fundamental characteristics and the style of argumentation for cosmopolitan socialism. So the first is anti-essentialism. The second is internationalism. The third one is trying to maintain a healthy culture, a relatively diverse culture amongst uh, leftist elements. And the fourth is, you know, essentially, we need to get real about ideology as a material force. Mm -hmm. And this is something we, we've been constantly called back to anyway. I mean, you know, from, not only going back to Lars Guattari, but going back to Wilhelm Reich's mass psychology of fascism. <laughs> the idea, okay, why do people vote against their interests? And 
I guess I wanted to ask if we could expand upon these four points, but also within the, the remit of the style of, of argumentation you advocate for, which is a return to not necessarily moralism, but a, a humanism, a humanist universalist morality aspect of arguing for these things. Um, in that sense, you know, how, you know, what, what, what were we lacking in the sense of not to be avoiding questions of justice? And then what could be the benefits to, and also some, maybe the limits of such argumentation, because is there a sense of reducing it to, to, to the discursive? Or if we, if we say that, are we just waiting for the material conditions to arrive and then suddenly everyone's going to get off out of their chairs and go, okay, let's go fight. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think these are the core questions, right? So uh, on my four points, I want to stress that a lot of them were drawn from uh, Michael Brooks' own um, arguments for cosmopolitan socialism, uh, albeit like fleshed out by me. And I think the core insight uh, in his arguments was that we always need to historicize everything, right? Uh, recognize that the social conditions that we inhabit and the social identities that we relate to uh, aren't something that are delivered to us from on high. Uh, they are the products of human will and human reason and intelligence. You know, it's back to the kind of tradition of German idealism and materialism that I was talking about before, right? Uh, and it's from this that we get something like a commitment to anti-essentialism, but also a kind of humanism, right? Uh, recognizing that human beings create their own social world, uh, not always under conditions that are favorable to them and not always under conditions that they fully understand, but we are the ones that uh, create it, right? Uh, in terms, though, of the more important question you bring up about moral argumentation, this is something that I have engaged in oh so many debates with uh, across, you know, with my Marxist friends in particular, right? Uh, and I think that we're not going to have time to exhaustively cover the subject matter here. Uh, but there's a long history uh, of socialist agitation, uh, which has held that ultimately Marxism is fundamentally a descriptive science uh, of society. Uh, and it is a science that can allow us to make predictions about the future. Uh, and the biggest prediction that we can make, of course, is that the intrinsic contradictions inherent to capitalism will eventually lead to its downfall and its replacement with a higher form of society. Right Now, how this is going to come about, uh, the exact methods applied to study society very widely, depending on the Marxist figure that we're talking about. That's the basic argument, right? Uh, and I want to be very clear. I am not critical of the need to study society accurately, right? Um, I am certainly not critical of the need to understand power, for example, and how it operates in society. I would argue that moralism uh, without a theory of power underpinning it uh, really becomes impotent very quickly. And I'll get back to that, right? Uh, but I think that ultimately there are two problems with this view that socialism should be scientific exclusively, right? Uh, the first problem is that all the kind of teleological expectations that the imminent or intrinsic contradictions in capitalism would lead to its collapse and replacement with socialism have proven for the most part to be false, right? Uh, now, there are deep theoretical reasons for this, I think, but I won't get into it. Uh, but as a hypothesis, it just hasn't held up very well, right? Um, and, you know, I just finished writing a very positive review of Lukash's book, The Destruction of Reason, uh, which is a very interesting guide to right-wing thought that everyone should read. Uh, but, you know, he writes this way, for instance, in his epilogue, right, about the Soviet Union, uh, describing it as a country of the future, the embodiment of reason, uh, how bourgeois irrationalism is ultimately going to fail in the face of its monumental productivity and power for human emancipation. Look at that in hindsight, right? It's hard not to think there were errors there, right? The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, you know, most forms of command economy, um authoritarian social movement disappeared along with them. Uh, so that's a problem, right? But the second argument is that whatever you might think uh, of scientific socialism, it doesn't really offer a lot of reasons to find a socialist alternative appealing from a normative standpoint. In fact, there are people out there who could even accept the descriptive claims of scientific socialism while seeing the outcome they postulated as a very bad thing. And that's not a hypothetical, right? Uh, think about something like Joseph Schupenter, the author of Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Uh, it's a very rich, very interesting text written by kind of libertarian, authoritarian, economist-ish, very complicated guy, right? And he says, I actually agree with Marx, right? Uh, capitalism's intrinsic contradictions uh, are going to lead to it falling apart. It's going to be replaced by a bureaucratic form of socialism. And we're all going to be the worst for it, right? It's terrible. Uh, and we should do whatever we can to hold off the inevitable as long as possible, right? Uh, and I say this demonstrates the need, amongst other things, uh, to put forward a moral case for why it is that people like Schupenter 
should um, want the intrinsic contradictions in capitalism to lead to its replacement by a socialist community, right? Uh, and that will mean appealing to norms of justice, morality, uh, and I think ultimately human emancipation and human equality. Uh, and there are a variety of different socialist authors that I think have done brilliant work uh, in this respect. Uh, one of the most prominent that I share an affection with, with um, my friend Ben Burgess, is of course G.A. Cohen, right? Sorry, uh, who did more than almost anybody else to develop an analytically rigorous account of socialist justice that can be used as a template going forward. Uh, I also think that people like Lillian Tchercia uh, and the good people at Left of Phil are doing a great job uh, in kind of mm. resurging mm. or rejuvenating interest uh, in left-wing moral projects more generally. Uh, and Lillian does some very interesting mm. work on the association of socialist morality with liberal morality uh, that you know, mm -hmm. I think we can all learn from. Uh, and I would also argue people like Cornell West, right, are, are doing a great job in connecting uh, the arguments for a socialist project to various kinds of moral impulses, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. these give the left power, right? Uh, since moral argumentation can often be persuasive, uh, where just pointing mm -hmm. to empirical facts about our social situation, this might not be, right? Uh, now, I am not saying uh, ever when I argue that the left should build a moral case for socialism, that we should abandon the attempt to be scientific and rigorous in our analysis of society. Uh, because like I said, I think that moralism without a theory of power underpinning it uh, is very impotent extremely quickly. Uh, and I think that that's one of the great deficits uh, that one finds in the utopian mm -hmm. socialist tradition, pre-Marx uh, and contemporary socialist theories that decide they're just not gonna give any kind of account of social dynamics at all, right? Uh, and I include some of the later work of G.A. Cohen in that category, for example, right? Uh, but it's the combination of the two that I think will allow mm. us to be theoretically successful enough uh, to serve as a platform uh, for various left movements going forward. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I even like to apply to the Gramscian principle uh, on this point, mm. which is that when it comes to analyzing power, we need a tremendous pessimism of the will. But when it comes to advocating for our moral convictions, we need an awful lot of optimism. Uh, sorry, we need a lot of pessimism in the intellect and we need an awful lot of optimism in the will when it comes to advocating for our moral standpoints. Sorry, I just had a big debate before, so a little tired. No, absolutely no problem. I mean, there's, there's a spectre haunting the discussion here, which is not so much, originally I thought maybe it's John Brawl, but it's actually it's Maximilian Robespierre. <laughs> Virtue without terror, is is uh, impotent terror without virtue is useless. <laughs> and so this made me to me to return. I mean, Trotsky was quite a cold thinker. He just was a bit too extreme and got his head locked off. But yeah, that is. Did. That's the, that is the how-to guide for cold and socialism out now on Zero Books. I'm just spoken here with the author Matt McManus. Matt, thank you so much for coming back on. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you know, I'm really excited about this book coming out. Uh, it's been a long process because of all the ups and downs with you know the pandemic and the session and the action and all that stuff. Uh, so I hope people enjoy this book. And um, again, for everybody who's a fan of Michael Brooks, like I am, um, I hope that you read this uh, and uh, it reignites a little bit of the spirit uh, of Brooks in you because uh, he was a remarkable guy, uh, not just a remarkable thinker, but a remarkable human being. He is sorely missed. And this is the closest I can give to a tribute to his influence. Thank you so much. I'll catch you guys later. Thanks. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.